We'll just get started. We just heard the batteries on this might be low, but we'll get started if it goes off. He'll, he'll help us. Ourselves, I'll start. Um, my name is Swapna Kumar. I work at the University of Florida, and uh, I'm in the Educational Technology Program. We run a lot of online courses and completely online programs, both doctoral and masters, and we have very successful on-campus masters and doctoral program. So um, the, some of this that you'll hear today started with me asking some questions about how different is it for a convener or an instructor to design and implement a MOOC as opposed to an online course, because that's where we are going. Um, and so I contacted a very successful MOOC that, that was very successful in the, in the area of technology, and educational technology, and tried to find out how the conveners planned collaboratively. There were eight conveners six. from six, six totally, six. finally six, yeah, from two countries. And I thought that was amazing that they got, got this done so well. So I handed over to Martin to describe the course, and, um, or if you call it a course, I think so. Okay, thank you. So I'm one of the instructors, and um, maybe I also very shortly. Um, you will find me on the web, of course. Normally, I'm working at the uh, Graz University of Technology in the social learning department. I'm the head and self of responsible for e-learning, and as well, I'm also senior researcher at the Institute for Information Systems and Computer Media. Sometimes Professor Mara um, is a name, and I was um, more or less his latest research doctor. Um, yeah, so you find me on the web and um, what we've done, first of all, just uh, forget for a couple of minutes about MOOC. Um, I introduced um, a different, uh, we have a big issue in Middle Europe that's called copyright. And why is this, this is a very big issue? Because our teachers, our lecturers take the material from the net, put it in their slides, and show it to the students. Uh, the students take this slide, make the comments, send an email to the next student, and so on and so on. And all this issue, if there is no appropriate license, we have the problem of the copyright. And um, yes, what can be done? Because we have um, the next thing, the next big thing is digital classrooms. That when you think that school children have their own tablets, are coming to schools then you really need digital materials as teacher. Uh, you have to uh, find things, you have to provide it to the children, and they got exchange, they fill out something, send you back uh, via email. And then you don't can take care about copyright. And um, the solution in the long run, especially for middle Europe, is um, rather simple. It's open educational resources. Uh, you have to use open educational resources, you have to bring it to the classroom and to explain teachers and lecturers why is it important uh, on the first side to use open educational resources as well as to produce open educational resources. And um, that was our idea because as we are very famous in the German speaking era, especially for the issue of open educational resources, we are working since 2006 on it. And our idea in the first run was to provide an online course, more or less an open online course, of course, because we are talking about open education resources, but our thought was not to make a massive one. We just, uh, our idea was we have to provide some materials online, everyone, every teacher can access and use it for their own uh, lecture. So, and uh, then we start just this course called uh, ZOER means Course for Open Educational Resources in 2013, so uh, uh, one year ago, from April to June, and um, we just uh, offered it on the web. And as Swapna introduced, we were um, six institutes um, in the German speaking area from Austria, Graz, um, till Tübingen, um, Munich, um, and so on. And um, we hosted this, uh, this um, CMOOC with six, six institutions, about 12 weeks. So that means for each topic we have chosen two weeks um, for the lecturers to learn. And we also provided some badges at the end of the course, so that the teachers um, also say, okay, we, we passed the course. What um, did we use on the technical um, side? We uh, take the main website, GRSS Hopper. Maybe you are familiar with it. This is the famous software from Stephen Downs. He introduced it one on 
of his first MOOCs in 2008. It's open source and you can use it for your own. Um, the main thing about it is that it's a very good blog aggregator. So you um, aggregate all the RSS feeds of your user and can provide them with a user management system. And then you can also send newsletters or whatever. Then we have additionally a discussion forum. We have also, of course, a Twitter hashtag. And during our runtime, that means um, that was not our initiative as uh, uh, instructors, there were also a Facebook group and a Google uh, Plus group provided from the participants who started um, also these groups. And we have, of course, all these private web blogs and, uh, of the participants and of also um, yes, as I mentioned before, we started as a just open online course for free and we get about 1,000 participants uh, who are interested in uh, this course. It is uh, for only the German speaking area a very high rate. So normally you get uh, two, three hundred, but not a uh, thousand. And um, we have about 500 contributions to the forum, we have about 300 blog posts more than 2,000 tweets, and in the end we have uh, 90 participants who um, take the badges. So here you can see some uh, data about the online events, because in each of these two weeks there were at least two online events, where there was also an expert talk or something similar of an input, and of course, as usual in MOOCs, you have a very high rate in the beginning and a very low rate in the end. Um, but the main thing interesting is also the uh, thing that this blue one here is are the live participants. The two were particip uh, participate live in the event, and you see this one here is who uh, took uh, the event afterwards, uh, the recording of the event. Then uh, the blog posts, of course, um, a similar thing. You have uh, the most blog posts in the beginning, um, only 20 in the end. And now I can uh, give over to Vladna because she just interviewed us and that's the results of the interviews. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, like I said, I was interested in how do six institutions, because I'm used to online courses that we plan within our department, we know what we're doing, you know, we work together, works fine. How do you collaborate across six institutions to create something that is so successful, right? And I used... Um, I work a lot with teaching presence because a lot of my research is on online learning. Um, so I looked at the literature on teaching presence and put together an interview protocol that looked at how do you plan, how do you implement, how do you facilitate, and how do you evaluate. So you know what, what was the was the complete experience, and and contacted them and I interviewed six of these um, of the six that were active at the end. So the the one thing to remember is that so these are six individuals with six not completely differing agendas interested in open educational resources, interested that this content should get out there and believing in some way in the importance of the content, right? So um, the one thing that all six of them were very clear on is that we might have been able to put something together alone, but not something this good. Because different people brought different strengths. Some people were Im immensely good at the content, some brought the technical infrastructure, could work with the technology, Others were good at facilitating. The one thing to remember though is all these six people had some experience with e-learning online, online teaching and had successfully hosted online events of some nature. So they had some experience already coming in about how to plan and implement this. Some of them had already been in, involved in MOOCs. So, but despite that, they felt this ran this well because we all brought something to it. And the fact that there were so many people, you know, one person who was completely overwhelmed by the number of people, it might, 1,000 might seem little to you compared to the ex MOOCs you've been listening to, but for a C MOOC, that's a lot, and it's intensely, um, you know, managed, as in these people were in the forums everywhere because this is a C MOOC, a connectivist MOOC. So one person said, I didn't have to do anything, but I also didn't have to know everything about everything because there were other experts to answer questions. And this is, a, as, as Martin will probably say later, is an emerging area that's a lot of discussion. This was a discussion, in, discussion intensive. So um, the other huge theme that emerged, from, apart from the fact that different people bring different strengths, was that different people have different comfort levels with technology as conveners. Right? So there are those who already are tweeting, Facebook, everything. Then there's a convener who doesn't have a Facebook account. Right? And, and this course took place in multiple virtual spaces. 
there was a discussion forum, there, were, there was Twitter, there was a Facebook group, there was a blog, and there were different groups discussing in different areas. And, you know, the, the, the advantage was that different people with different comfort levels would manage different virtual spaces. But the way the course was set up, each convener had a responsibility for two weeks. So the challenge is, am I going to be tweeting or discussing through the course, even those weeks where I'm not um, part of it? So the, the, there were lots of these issues that they had not discussed ahead. They met very intensively for the planning, to discuss the content, what goes into each week, what are the thematic units, what videos will be used, how are the experts going to be working, and some people had, everybody had a different style. But with the one thing they did not discuss is who's going to manage which areas, is, at least this is what I heard from the interviews, Martin would be able to say that was really the case. Um, they, they did not discuss that ahead of time, which made it slightly problematic because it's possible that the same discussion is happening, you know, in Twitter, is also happening in the discussion forum, is also happening in the closed Facebook group, then, you know, and, and certain conveners are missing out on what's going on elsewhere or a question is being asked where the expert could not answer because they were not <coughs> listening, so to speak, in the virtual space. So they, they interacted based on their own familiarity. So the one thing, the, the lessons learned in the end, um, to, to wrap this up really quick, was, you know, in a, in a typical online course, and this is, what I, this is my takeaway, um, you know who your learners are going to be. Even here, the, the conveners did plan for two types of learners, a beginner level, entry level who wanted to know about OER, and a, an advanced level who knew something about OER but wanted to engage with the discussion. So they planned for those two, but they could not plan for the diversity of the learners, also for the technological diversity of the learners, because in terms of where the learners will move around, so in terms of uh, you know, where the learners will, will play. It, within the course. So they, they felt that they needed to next time clearly define roles and responsibilities for when, after the course began, not just for the content, before the course began, about where who would be and how much will be done by whom. Because some people did a lot, some people did less, which is always the case with team teaching. Um, and that it was as important, they met multiple times before the course started. Once the course started, they were so busy, they did not make the time to meet again. So that's a, a takeaway for anyone planning. To, to plan that in, to, to meet after a course starts. So our discussion in the paper is really about collaboration, how the collaboration worked in the planning stage and after. They all were very happy with the collaboration. They felt they, they worked really well together. Um, they like each other, most of them. I, that's the impression I get as an outsider. And um, so it worked really well that they, they did a lot. But the digital habitats were where the problems lied, uh, lay, um, because they, um, you know, the conveners habit, how do you say, um, lived in certain habitats, students lived in certain habitats, different people gravitated towards different areas, and managing that needed clarity, and which they did not get after a certain point of time. Some people felt they were managing all the different virtual areas, other people were not doing anything, they were responsible only for their weeks, and did not bother with the other weeks. So there was some challenge in that area. Methodological reflections in terms of my interviewing these people coming in from the outside with very little experience of the MOOC itself. I tried to look at it as much as possible before talking to them. But the main thing is I brought them the data after I interviewed them and they knew that. So when I interviewed them, the problem could be they knew I would be discussing the data with all of them that they maybe did not want to say anything negative about each other. You know, that's possible. Um, and that, that they wrote the paper with me. But that to me was a valuable experience. So. I think, I think it worked really well. Something to think about is really to get an external person to come in and talk to the facilitators of the MOOC or the collaborators on a MOOC to understand the content. So that's pretty much it. And um, you, know, you can read the paper for the rest. I was just told I have a minute. So you need intensive planning. You have to discuss, you really have to design and discuss how you're going to manage the virtual spaces in terms of responsibilities and adapt maybe different virtual spaces to thematic units, not expect everything to be everywhere all the time. And anything can happen. You can have weird learners, you can have learners who suddenly go off and do something else in a new virtual space, and you need to be able to handle that. So that's pretty much it. Do you want to add anything, Martin? Thank you so much.